Good afternoon and good morning and good evening, depending on from when and where you are joining us. I'm Dr. Phoebe Thorpe, and it's my pleasure to welcome you to CDC Public Health Grand Rounds. Our, so our topic is e-cigarettes, an emerging public health challenge. It's a very exciting session, so let's get started. Uh, but first, a few housekeeping slides. Public Health Grand Rounds offers continuing education credits to physicians, nurses, and others. Please check out the CDC Continuing Education Credit website for more information. You can also check us out on our website and on all your favorite social media sites. We also have a video segment called Beyond the Data, which will be posted shortly after the session. For today's session, we will be taking questions by email. That's www.cdc.gov slash CDC Grand Rounds. We've also partnered with the CDC Public Health Library to feature scientific articles related to e-cigarettes. The full listing is available at cdc.gov slash library slash cyclips. Here is a preview of our upcoming Public Health Grand Round sessions. Please join us live or on the web. I'd also like to make a note that the next session, it will be Monday at 10. So that's both a change in the day and the time that the session will be held. Thank you. I'd also like to give a shout out to our colleagues and friends, including Jim Bueller, the health commissioner of the city of Philadelphia. They are holding their first public health grand rounds tomorrow evening, and we wish them well in their endeavor. In addition to our outstanding speakers, I'd also like to acknowledge the important contributions of the individuals listed here, and a special thank you to the folks at the CDC Tobacco Lab. Thank you very much. And now a few words from CDC Director, Dr. Tom Frieden. Thanks very much, and thanks very much to our speakers for being here. E-cigarettes are a hot topic, even if they're not combustible. And uh, <clears throat> we have to look at e-cigarettes through the lens of tobacco and in the context of a tobacco problem that continues to kill close to half a million Americans every year. Since the first Surgeon General's report on tobacco in 1964, more than 20 million Americans have been killed by tobacco, and we still have more than 40 million smokers in this country. We've made a lot of progress raising awareness of the harms of tobacco. Uh, one of those uh, ways that we've done that is through the Tips from Former Smokers campaign. That's a campaign that we've been able to run for the past three years, and rigorous analysis indicates that that campaign prevents at least 16,000 deaths for each year we run it. But e-cigarettes really raise some challenges. If an individual who's already a smoker of combustible tobacco products switches entirely to e-cigarettes, there's little doubt that their health will be improved. On the other hand, if adolescents who would not have become smokers begin using e-cigarettes, there is a high likelihood that their risk of using combustible tobacco will be greater. And if an adult who tries to quit smoking uses e-cigarettes, there is a possibility that that individual will be more likely to continue so-called dual use or using both combustible cigarettes and e-cigarettes than com quitting completely compared with what they might have done if they had not been using e-cigarettes. So we have real uncertainty and real risk. In public health, one of our most basic principles is the precautionary principle, to ensure in simple language that we're better safe than sorry. And it's important to recognize when we think about e-cigarettes, these are tobacco products. They're highly addictive. They contain nicotine. Nicotine is uh, likely to be harmful for the developing brain and certainly an addictive substance that may result in someone having a lifetime of addiction. So we're still in the uh, morning phase for Yogi Berra, so we still quote him at all opportunities. Uh, one of those uh, quotations is that uh, in theory, theory and practice are the same. In practice, they're different. <laughs> well, in theory, if all smokers switched to e-cigarettes, uh, things would be better and lives would be saved. And there are anecdotes of people who have switched from 
combustibles to e-cigarettes, uh, but we all know that the plural of anecdote is not data. In practice, we've seen a lot of kids using e-cigarettes, including kids who've never smoked combustible cigarettes, and a lot of smokers continuing to smoke when perhaps they would have quit if they hadn't also been using e-cigarettes. Uh, in theory, also, we could divorce the harm of tobacco from the addictiveness of nicotine. Um, this theory is an interesting one and perhaps will be put into practice at some point or in some place in the future. The idea would be that there would be many forms of nicotine readily available to adults, uh, but there would be no addictive levels of nicotine present in combustible tobacco, at least. It's a theory. Um, <clears throat> but the precautionary principle is key here to, above all, do no harm uh, and ensure at a minimum that we try to keep uh, kids away from all forms of nicotine, including e-cigarettes. What we're also seeing with the tobacco industry, I think, has uh, resonance with some other parts of public health. We see the tobacco industry really being relentless. Uh, their role is to sell a uh, product that kills people, and they identify new ways to do it. The tobacco companies have now purchased most of the e-cigarette companies to hedge their bets, and as you'll see from today's presentation, the marketing tools being used by e-cigarettes and e-cigarette companies are very similar to what we saw in tobacco years before. This creates real challenges for the public and for public health because we have to keep pace with changes in the tobacco industry, and we have to also uh, keep in mind that unlike some of the other entities that we battle against, stopping tobacco requires always thinking about what the industry is doing that may undermine public health progress. So in that regard, thanks very much to our speakers and looking forward to the presentations. Thank you, Dr. Frieden. And now for our first speaker, Dr. Brian King. Great. Thank you, Dr. Thorpe, for the, the introduction. I'm very happy to be here today. Um, so my section of today's um, conversation is going to focus on a background of e-cigarettes and the current landscape in the United States, as well as some patterns of use among both youth and young adults. And then I'll end with some, some key findings before we go into some of the other uh, components, such as the, the health consequences. So to start, e-cigarettes are part of a broader class of products uh, that are known as electronic nicotine delivery systems, or ENDS. Uh, for today's presentation, we're going to use e-cigarettes as a universal term to describe the, the entire uh, product type. However, it's important to note that this is a rapidly diversifying landscape, and these products and the, the, the terminology used to describe them continues to change on a nearly a daily basis, and that there's different terminology used by the manufacturers, the retailers, as well as the individual users of these products. It's also important to note that these products are manufactured by different entities, including the traditional tobacco industry as well as those from the smaller private sector. And they're sold by a variety of different venues, including convenience stores, vape shops, and even the internet. Um, and at last count, there's currently about 450 different brands of e-cigarettes, but I can tell you that that continues to change daily. Now, there are currently three major types of e-cigarettes or ends on the market. On the far left here is an example of the mini e-cig or the cig-alike e-cigarette. Uh, these products are typically pre-filled with liquid and the user discards the entire device after the liquid has been depleted. In the middle, you have the mid-sized e-cigarettes, which are typically rechargeable and they can be refilled by the user using cartridges with their preferred flavoring or nicotine concentration of choice. And on the far left, we have the, the modified e-cigarettes, which are frequently referred to by users as mods or tank systems. Um, and these are customizable by the user, who can directly fill the device with the, their own liquid um, of choice, containing varying levels of, of flavors, as well as nicotine concentrations. So irrespective of the type of e-cigarette, the basic anatomy is really quite similar, and that's what's uh, presented on this slide here. They share very similar components, including a battery that serves as a power source, because they are electronic, um, an atomizer to heat and to aerosolize the solution, and then also a cartridge to hold the solution, and that creates an aerosol that the user then inhales. 
Now, before we get into the patterns of use, it's important um, to, to discuss e-cigarettes in the context of tobacco prevention and control over the past 50 years. And so prior to the first Surgeon General's report, tobacco use rose dramatically. Um, but after 1964 and the first Surgeon General's report, we implemented a series of population-based proven interventions. Um, and, and some of those include the Fairness Doctrine that limited tobacco advertising for TV and radio. Um, and after, after that, tobacco use began to decline. Uh, and this was followed in 1998 by the Master Settlement Agreement, which further restricted the sale and marketing of tobacco products at the population level. However, this wasn't uh, without the contribution of other proven evidence-based interventions that we know work to effectively reduce tobacco use at the population level. Those include our tried and true interventions, including increasing the price of tobacco, implementing comprehensive smoke-free laws, hard-hitting mass media campaigns, proven access to cessation resource alongside sustained and fully funded comprehensive uh, tobacco control programs at the state and local level. And an additional component that's critical to this discourse is regulation. Um, and these uh, proven interventions that I've discussed should be done in coordination with effective regulation. Now, in the U.S. in 2009, the U.S. Food and Drug Administration was granted the authority to regulate the manufacturing, marketing, and sale of tobacco products. Now, the definition of a tobacco product is any, tobacco, any product that's made or derived from tobacco that is intended for human consumption. Now, given that the nicotine in e-cigarettes is typically derived from tobacco, the FDA has proposed to regulate e-cigarettes containing tobacco or containing nicotine as tobacco products, and that occurred in April of 2014. Um, however, the rule is not yet finalized, so e-cigarettes are currently unregulated at the federal level in the United States. So before we get into the, the patterns of use, I'd just like to mention that the public health framework outlined in the 50th anniversary Surgeon General Report on the health consequences of tobacco, which was released in 2014. And in particular, that report noted that shifts in the patterns of tobacco use that we're seeing over time, including the marked increase in e-cigarettes, could have negative and positive individual and population health impacts. But the report also importantly noted that the burden of death and disease from tobacco use in the U.S. is overwhelmingly caused by cigarettes and other combustible tobacco products. Thus, any of this negative or potential positive impacts of e-cigarettes should be considered in the context of how these products may impact combustible tobacco use, including cigarettes. So now let's look at some estimates of e-cigarette use among the U.S. population. We will start with adults. This slide presents estimates of ever use of e-cigarettes. So that's even just one time use of e-cigarettes among U.S. adults during the period 2010 to 2013. As you can see, marked increases in ever use have occurred primarily among current and former cigarette smokers. And in 2013, over one third of current cigarette smokers have ever used an e-cigarette, while well, about one in 10 former smokers had used these products. Uh, in contrast, rates of ever use of e-cigarettes have remained relatively stable among never cigarette smokers over time. Now this slide presents a past 30 day or what we call current use of e-cigarettes and again this is among adults. So during the period 2012 to 2013, 9.4% of conventional cigarette smokers also currently used e-cigarettes. Um, however, it's also important to look at the converse here. And among current e-cigarette users, 76.8% or three quarters were also current cigarette smokers in 2012 to 2013. And this is a phenomenon that we call a dual use, which we're going to, to hear more about uh, later today from some of our other presenters. So now let's look at some data among youth. Now these data from the National Youth Tobacco Survey demonstrate that ever use of e-cigarettes among U.S. middle and high school students has increased considerably since 2011. Uh, in 2014, over one quarter of U.S. high school students and one in 10 middle school students had ever used an e-cigarette at least once in their lifetime. This is of concern because most of these products contain nicotine, which we've already discussed, which besides being highly addictive, can also be potentially harmful to the developing adolescent brain. And we're going to hear more about that later from our, our subsequent speakers. Now this slide is the, the patterns of current use, again, past 30-day use among youth. And you can see that in 2014, 13% uh, 0.4% of U.S. Uh, high school students had used an e-cigarette in the past 30 days, and about 3.9% of middle school students had used these products uh, in the past 30 days. 
And we're also seeing alarmingly high prevalence of e-cigarettes among youth who have never um, used uh, conventional cigarettes, um, which has increased nearly threefold from since 2011. Um, in 2013, it was uh, 263,000 uh, U.S. middle and high school students who had uh, never used a conventional cigarette had used an e-cigarette. Um, and moreover, a recent CDC study that was published found that among these non-smoking youth, the intention to smoke conventional cigarette is higher among those who have actually used e-cigarettes. But one limitation of these data is that they're cross-sectional. So that means that you collect the data at one point in, in time. So there's an emerging body of research that has actually followed uh, the same youth over time to better understand what the relationship is between e-cigarettes and cigarette use. And this slide presents two of those studies that have been uh, published to date in the peer-reviewed literature. Um, the first example is a study that was published in the Journal of the Medi American Medical Association that found among high school students in Los Angeles, those who had ever used e-cigarettes at baseline were two 2.7 times more likely to report initiation of combustible tobacco use over the next year compared to non-users. And there were similar findings in a subsequent study published in JAMA Pediatric among adolescents and young adults, which found an even greater odds of progressing to cigarette smoking. So an important caveat here is that these are preliminary studies, a relatively small sample size, and the generaliz generalizability to broader populations is limited. So we still need some further longitudinal research in this area. But it's, these initial findings are still quite concerning and that they suggest there's a potential path um, for e-cigarette use to lead to conventional uh, tobacco use in the future among youth. And so one of the factors that's important to note here in terms of the, the escalating use of, of e-cigarettes uh, among youth is uh, the availability of flavors. Um, and a CDC recently released an MMWR um, and within the past month that found in 2014 among middle and high school students who used an e-cigarette in the past 30 days, 63.3% or 1.58 million students nationwide had used a flavored e-cigarette. And we know from the existing literature for conventional tobacco products that flavor can make these products particularly appealing um, to youth. And so in conclusion, uh, e-cigarettes are currently unregulated in the United States, and the product landscape is rapidly growing and diversifying as we speak. Uh, e-cigarette use has increased steadily among U.S. adults in recent years, and that's primarily been driven by current and former cigarette smokers. Uh, moreover, we're seeing alarmingly sharp increases in youth e-cigarette use, which have occurred since 2011, and emerging longitudinal data suggests that e-cigarette use might lead to subsequent combustible tobacco use among youth in the future. And one of the factors that may be contributing to this uh, youth use of e-cigarettes is flavors. In 2014, we had uh, nearly 1.6 million current youth e-cigarette users who had used a flavored e-cigarette. And so that concludes my portion of the talk on patterns of uh, use among youth and adults. And now I'm going to turn it over to my colleague, uh, Dr. Jonathan Samet, to discuss the, the health consequences of e-cigarettes. My, my charge is to discuss uh, what we might uh, surmise about the potential health consequences of electronic cigarettes based on what we know about the aerosol that they deliver, its components, and uh, initial studies of health uh, consequences. So the aerosol uh, contains propylene glycol and some vegetable glycerin as the vehicle. It may contain nicotine and does uh, in the predominance of uh, use and the dosage uh, can vary depending on the concentration in the uh, liquid uh, as well as the operation. Flavorings, which are a potential concern, and then a variety of contaminants have been identified within the aerosol, uh, some listed here, tobacco-specific nitrosamines, metals, formaldehyde, and acrolein. And these are compounds for which we have uh, some information. Of course, we have um, a great deal about nicotine, and I'll be uh, addressing that. The electronic cigarettes deliver an aerosol that is composed of the droplets uh, generated by the device. These are particulate in nature and of the right size to reach the uh, airways uh, and alveoli, the air sacs within the lung. The uh, materials in the droplets are, of course, deposited within the uh, lung, so they may act there. And then, of course, some uh, move across the uh, membrane, the lining of the lung, into the circulation, uh, for example, uh, nicotine. Now, in thinking about the potential health risks, let's start with nicotine. This topic was reviewed in depth 
in the 2014 report of the Surgeon General, and I'm going to quickly run through uh, conclusions found there. Of course, at high enough doses, nicotine has acute toxicity, raising concern about the potential for poisoning, particularly for uh, infants, children, uh, and children. Nicotine is a pharmacologically active molecule that activates multiple biological pathways. We're particularly concerned about nicotine exposure during fetal development. This is a critical window for brain development, and we have uh, data from both uh, human and uh, animal models that there are lasting adverse consequences of nicotine exposure during pregnancy. Uh, there are other effects uh, on uh, fetal health uh, and adverse birth uh, outcomes are a consequence. Uh, continuing, there's suggestive evidence that nicotine exposure during adolescence, when the brain is still developing, uh, may have lasting adverse uh, consequences. Uh, and in summary, nicotine, uh, beginning with gestation and moving through adulthood, of course, has adverse effects, among which is uh, addiction. Uh, the 1988 Surgeon General's report was the first to offer a conclusion that, in fact, nicotine is the drug in tobacco that causes uh, addiction. We have uh, evidence from uh, poison centers about the concern about acute toxicity from poisoning. This is uh, just counts of calls to poison centers across a four-year span, and you can see the rising number of reports related to uh, e-cigarettes. One particular concern is flavorings. Uh, the uh, prevalence of flavorings in uh, electronic cigarettes has already been highlighted. Many of these flavorings are used in foods where they're so-called generally recognized as safe. They're generally recognized as safe for ingestion, but not for inhalation, uh, an entirely different uh, route of delivery, of course, from eating foods with uh, flavorings. One flavoring has already been linked to a serious lung disease. That is diacetyl, a flavoring used to uh, give a butter-like uh, flavor. In uh, workers making microwave popcorn with butter flavoring, a, a serious uh, obstructive lung disease that can be fatal, bronchiolitis obliterans was uh, identified more than a decade uh, ago. And we know that some of the flavorings in use uh, in e-cigarettes uh, have a structure similar to that of diacetyl. So this is a, an area of concern. We have some data on respiratory uh, symptoms in children who are using uh, electronic cigarettes. These are data from the uh, Southern uh, California study, the Children's Health Study, uh, looking at the prevalence of bronchitic symptoms in uh, users of electronic cigarettes. These are 11th and 12th graders, uh, ever users having a twofold increased risk of uh, chronic cough, and even among those who were not uh, cigarette smokers, uh, there was an increased risk for bronchitic symptoms of about uh, 60 uh, percent. The, uh, with regard to uh, smoking cessation, uh, as already mentioned, there are many anecdotes and testimonials as to the potential effectiveness of electronic cigarettes for smoking cessation. However, hard evidence is limited. There's been a recent uh, review, systematic review, with the finding of uh, only a few trials that actually met methodological criteria for being adequately executed. These uh, s studies pointed to the uh, two conclusions highlighted at the bottom. Electronic cigarettes may help to reduce the number of cigarettes smoked. And there's little evidence on efficacy for cessation compared with proven cessation uh, therapies for which uh, there's a substantial body of clinical trial evidence. When we uh, take a look at the uh, entire picture and look at uh, potential harms and the potential benefits of having electronic cigarettes available, uh, we see that there are a substantial number of potential harms as well as some potential benefits. So to highlight those, uh, and going back in part to Dr. Frieden's opening uh, remarks, we have concern about youth, the increased exposure to nicotine, the risk for initiation of conventional cigarettes, the long-term consequences for brain development, and, of course, today's adolescents are tomorrow's uh, middle-aged and older adults who will become at risk 
for the non-communicable diseases caused by uh, cigarette smoking should they uh, become smokers. For current smokers, concern about less cessation uh, and, of course, perhaps increase uh, disease risk compared to what they would have should they uh, completely stop smoking. For former smokers, the possibility of returning to being nicotine addicted and generally uh, for society, uh, renormalization of nicotine and smoking and the potential for secondhand aerosol exposure. On the potential benefit side, the reduced disease risk for those who switch completely from cigarettes, combustible cigarettes, to electronic cigarettes, or the possibility that they, those smokers will reduce or quit cigarettes and perhaps reduce uh, disease uh, morbidity. We are, of course, at a point where we have incomplete um, evidence. Uh, the rise of electronic cigarettes is recent, and the health studies are only beginning. Here are some of the critical needs. Surveillance for emergent patterns of e-cigarette use, that, of course, is uh, underway uh, in many different uh, surveys and studies, carefully tracking nicotine addiction. There are sentinel events of concern, nicotine poisoning, respiratory complications that might point, for example, uh, to adverse effects of flavoring, toxicological screening of the uh, components, using our best contemporary methods, better understanding the abuse liability of electronic cigarettes and the role of flavorings, and finally, studies of effects in uh, key poss possibly susceptible groups, as uh, I have listed here, and I'm sure uh, there are other additions that could be made. So our evidence uh, is still incomplete, incomplete on health effects, uh, but we know that we need to gather uh, more. So with that, uh, let me uh, conclude and uh, pass the baton to uh, Dr. John Wiesman, Secretary of Health in Washington State. Great, thank you, John. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here today to talk with you about working on the front lines at the state and local uh, levels in terms of the e-cigarette arena. So e-cigarettes pose a significant challenge for us in public health practice as we attempt to address youth access and prevent youth from initiating smoking and vaping because we have two goals that may be at somewhat odds with each other. As Dr. Frieden said earlier, on the one hand, for adults who smoke and are addicted to nicotine and have not yet quit, encouraging them to totally switch to e-cigarettes is probably less harmful than smoking. And yet, on the other hand, for youth, taking up e-cigarette use is harmful to their health and should not be done at all. So implementing public policy that can accommodate both of these goals can be tricky. This is part of today's presentation, outlines the challenges we face in public health practice with this dilemma. In Washington State, our most recent youth data show e-cigarette use here in the chart in the yellow on the bottom, and those using only combustible cigarettes in the blue on the top, and those using both e-cigarettes and combustible cigarettes or dual use as we've described earlier is in green in the middle. For 10th graders in Washington, 17.9% are using e-cigarettes, and that similarly 7.5% are using combustible cigarettes. Whether or not e-cigarettes are a gateway to future tobacco use, I think we can all agree we would like to see these numbers be zero across the board for our youth. When it comes to public health practice and our goal to protect youth from using e-cigarettes and tobacco, our strategies rely on either reducing demand or reducing supply to, uh, to e-cigarette access. In order for this to be successful, we need to have adequate funding to implement these strategies. And as you're going to see in the next slide, that is currently very challenging for many of us. So the tactics that we use to implement these two strategies include public education and health promotion messages and campaigns, and changing policies, systems, and environments through community coalitions, organizational policies, and public policy efforts, which often require legislation and regulation. As we look at the ability to reduce demand, one approach is to educate our youth and their parents on e-cigarette harms in an effort to prevent youth seeking to purchase and use e-cigarette products. However, 
For many of us who have had significant state investments in tobacco prevention and control, the Great Recession took a huge toll on our tobacco funding. That is the case for Washington. Washington's resources for tobacco prevention and control for youth ranked 45th in 2014 for the percent of CDC recommended funding for these programs. And we're not alone. Washington joins 23 other states and the District of Columbia in spending less than 10% of the CDC recommendations on tobacco prevention programs. There are six states that actually spend 50% or more of those recommended amounts, and those are Alaska, North Dakota, Delaware, Wyoming, Hawaii, and Oklahoma. The state of Washington has not had any significant resources to implement a statewide public education and health promotion campaign around e-cigarettes. With extremely limited resources, current efforts focus on educating parents and adults to what e-cigarettes are, counteracting the misbelief that they're harmless, and encouraging parents to talk with their children about e-cigarettes. We've designed a web page to help provide this accurate information on e-cigarettes and vaping. Limited state funding has been provided to local health departments, community-based and tribal health agencies to provide education to their respective communities and address communities experiencing disparities. At the local level, specific educational program efforts include a community-driven coalition in King County called 206 Rising with the message that most youth rise above the influence. 206 Rising focuses on reducing and preventing youth substance abuse, including e-cigarettes. In addition, Don't Be Fooled messaging on e-cigarettes will appear soon on billboards and light rail in selected areas of the city. Tacoma Pierce County Health Department launched its Think Again Pierce County educational campaign in July of 2015, which includes a website, billboards, ads on cable TV, buses, and shelters, and a Facebook page. A second approach to reducing demand is to increase the cost of products, thereby discouraging their use. This has been an effective strategy, it's already been mentioned, for reducing tobacco demand for both adults but also especially for youth. It remains to be seen if this strategy will be effective for e-cigarettes, especially since these tend to be seen as electronic devices complete with USB charging ports and for this generation that pays large sums of money for electronics, there is a question of how price sensitive they may be. Furthermore, while the initial costs for the starter kit can be large, the ongoing costs are relatively small. This map shows the five states in District of Columbia that tax e-cigarettes. And while 12 states proposed taxing e-cigarettes in 2014, none of those pieces of legislation passed. There are a number of different potential approaches to taxing the electronic nicotine dispensers, including by the milliliters of liquid, by the milligrams of nicotine, or as a percentage of sales or the wholesale price, akin to what some of our states call other tobacco product taxation. Strategies for reducing the supply of or access of electronic cigarette equipment and liquid for youth generally require legislation and regulation. In order to enforce laws that restrict access, the licensing of those businesses that sell these products is essential. We need to know who is selling products and where they are selling the products to implement an effective oversight system. Kansas is currently the only state that licenses its e-cigarette ret retailers, although Massachusetts may soon follow. Another strategy to reduce supply is to raise the age for legal purchase of e-cigarette devices and supplies. Most states currently limit sales to those 18 and over. Four, Alabama, Alaska, New Jersey, and Utah limit sales to 19 and over. And earlier this year, Hawaii is leading the nation, having raised the age of legal purchase to 21 and over. Other regulatory actions that could be taken include requiring child-resistant containers to combat the increase in nicotine overdoses, especially in our youngest children. Retailers could also be required to place warnings on the labels or at points of sale. Another policy step would be to prohibit specific flavors, as was done with combustible cigarettes. An additional regulatory action would be to prohibit public use. 
Currently, in Washington state, four counties and a city in another county prohibit public use of e-cigarettes. Additional counties are considering local restrictions on the use and sale. And as you can see from this map, the states in orange prohibit the use of both e-cigarettes and combustible cigarettes in public indoor spaces. An emerging challenge of great concern is the new intersect with e-cigarettes and marijuana, or THC. Washington State, along with three other states, Alaska, Oregon, and Colorado, and the District of Columbia, have legalized the use of recreational marijuana, and 23 states have legalized the use of marijuana for medical purposes. These states are now seeing a proliferation of e-cigarettes preloaded with THC and the sale of e-juice with THC. This is extremely concerning in part because the use of THC in this delivery mode does not produce the usual smell of marijuana. This makes it impossible to distinguish what is being consumed in an e-cigarette, nicotine, THC, or both. So we now have a situation in which we can't tell what substances our youth are consuming in e-cigarettes. These products add another public health challenge for us. This last legislative session in Washington, we attempted to pass a comprehensive law addressing the many aspects of e-cigarettes as it relates to youth access and youth. While most legislators are alarmed at the rapid uptake of e-cigarette use in our youth, we found it a challenge to get majority approval for a comprehensive legislation because too many legislators objected to different aspects of the bill. The result was that we could not obtain majority support for the entire bill. Thus, we will move to a more limited approach this next session. We also found it a challenge to obtain enough support with the dilemma I opened my talk with, that for adults who smoke and have been unable to quit, totally switching to e-cigarette use is a reasonable public health harm reduction strategy. That has made it difficult to pass regulations and restrictions that make total sense for preventing youth access because it may simultaneously make it more difficult for adult harm reduction. Thus, the public health dilemma in practice. To help with this, we must continue our public health research. We must understand how much of a gateway e-cigarettes are to combustible tobacco use. We must understand adult use of e-cigarettes to see whether adults are using e-cigs to supplement their combustible tobacco use in times and places where they can't use combustible tobacco, rather than reducing their risk by totally replacing their combustible tobacco use. And we must better understand all of the health risks with e-cigarette use, which is very challenging in the industry here that is unregulated and rapidly changing. So with all of that said, as public health professionals, we can't wait for all the data we or our policymakers might like to have. We have to act with the information we have and the threat we understand. For these reasons, we in Washington State will continue to work towards implementing sensible public policy aimed at protecting our youth. And with that, I'll turn it over to Matt Myers for our last presentation. Thanks, John. Um, I want to talk about the impact of the emergence of e-cigarettes on the goal of obtaining a tobacco-free generation. My focus is on the impact in the, of the emergence of e-cigarettes on our nation's youth. Over the last 15 years, there has been substantial progress, both in reducing the percentage of youth who start smoking and the amount they smoke. The reduction in cigarette use has also been accompanied by a dramatic change in attitudes among youth. Smoking is no longer cool, chic, or sexy. In addition, progress in places that have adopted best practices further demonstrate that available tools can drive down youth tobacco use even lower than it is today, indeed, much lower. The lesson is, we know how to dramatically reduce youth tobacco use. This means that e-cigarettes are not needed to achieve a tobacco-free generation. The issue is, are they a threat to that goal? Since 1997, current cigarette smoking among youth has fallen from 36.4% to 15.7%, 
frequent cigarette use has fallen even further, from 16.7% to 5.6%. Today, youth who do smoke, smoke fewer cigarettes. The change is dramatic. The decline in youth tobacco use also cuts across racial and ethnic lines, <clears throat> although we have not made the same progress among those in, low so in the low socioeconomic class and among certain vulnerable populations, such as Native Americans, the LGBT community, and those with symptoms of mental illness. National figures also don't tell the entire story. Six states have already reduced youth tobacco use to below 10 percent, and three are at or below 7.5 percent, demonstrating that higher taxes, smoke-free air laws, hard-hitting mass media, and comprehensive tobacco control programs, as recommended by the CDC, work. For decades, the tobacco industry successfully portrayed cigarette smoking as cool, sexy, and a sign of rugged masculinity and independence, exemplified by the Marlboro Man and the Virginia Slims Woman. The dramatic and fundamental change in those attitudes, as reflected in this slide, is at the heart of the progress that has been made. Today's teen has never seen a TV ad for cigarettes, and since 1998, 17 years ago, many forms of the most egregious cigarette advertising have been banned. Now, the question is, do e-cigarettes threaten the progress that's been made? The e-cigarette industry, sadly, is using the same marketing tactics, the same themes, and the same images and messages that the tobacco industry used. Indeed, today, the major cigarette companies also make e-cigarettes. The threat is, will this alter decades of work that has changed youth perceptions and youth behavior? Let me show you what teens are seeing today. Cigarette ads were banned on TV in 1969 precisely because of their powerful effect on youth. For many, the e-cigarette ads now on TV is the first time they have ever seen tobacco ads on TV. The ads glamorize the use of e-cigarettes in a way not seen for cigarettes in years. They play off the most successful images used by the cigarette industry, including the rugged, masculine, rebellious, and fiercely independent image that made Marlboro the cigarette of choice for millions of adolescents, both boys and girls. Ads also feature today's equivalent of the Virginia Slims woman, depicting e-cigarette use as sexy and rebellious. E-cigarette ads have appeared in magazines that reach millions of teens, including Rolling Stone and Sports Illustrated Weekly. The e-cigarette industry also knows that sex sells. Like cigarette companies have long done, e-cigarette makers portray the use of their products as sexually attractive. And they use venues with a huge following, such as the Sports Illustrated swimsuit issue. This is from 2014. This is from 2015. And they dress men in scantily clad outfits to parade around New York giving free samples during Fashion Week. Anybody who thinks this is about harm reduction needs to redefine harm reduction. Sponsorship of sports, especially sports, the glamorized, risk-taking, was long a key part of the cigarette industry's arsenal. But this tactic has been banned for almost two decades. E-cigarettes have been brought it back, including new sports that appeal particularly to modern risk-taking youth. For decades, the tobacco companies also used sponsorship of music events to promote cigarettes to huge audiences, including kids. Cigarette sponsorships are now banned, but e-cigarette brands have brought this tactic back. A 2009 federal law banned fruit and candy-flavored cigarettes, but many e-cigarette companies now pitch similar flavors. Pina Colada cigarettes have now been replaced by Pina Colada e-cigarettes. The variety is infinite. They also use cartoons 
The website for blue e-cigarettes has featured a cartoon pitch man named Mr. Cool, reminiscent of the Joe Camel cartoon character that so effectively marketed cigarettes to kids in the 1990s and was banned by the 1998 Master Settlement Agreement with the states precisely because of its impact on our nation's young people. Now, the concern about the impact of e-cigarette marketing as currently done is not inconsistent with support for aggressive marketing of FDA-approved smoking cessation products to smokers. A comparison of marketing for nicotine replacement therapy with marketing for e-cigarettes demonstrates that it is possible to target smokers without a major impact on youth, using images that appeal to adult smokers for the purpose of encouraging them to quit without appealing to youth. These ads clearly target adult smokers with a message about the benefit of quitting smoking. Note, none of the themes that you saw in e-cigarette ads appear here. Risk-taking is replaced with themes about caring about your health and your family. Now, the question comes, what can the federal government do? do? The federal government has the legal authority to take steps to minimize the threats posed by e-cigarette marketing to the progress that has been made with youth. While I today will focus on the Food and Drug Administration, it's important to recognize that both the CDC and, as you heard earlier, state and local governments have a vital role to play in implementing a comprehensive approach. The 2009 Family Smoking Prevention and Tobacco Control Act authorizes FDA to assert jurisdiction over all other tobacco products, including e-cigarettes, and including its manufacturing, marketing, and sales. FDA announced its intention to do so in 2010, but didn't issue a proposed rule until April of 2014. Yesterday, the proposed final rule was transmitted to the White House, where it is now undergoing review. If adopted, the proposed rule will, for the first time, put in place a nationwide minimum age of sale, requires age verification, prohibits vending machine sales and free samples, and provides the states with the resources to effectively enforce these laws. While FDA has authority over the type of marketing the e-cigarette has employed, FDA's proposed rule did not include any restrictions on e-cigarette marketing. How quickly and how effectively it does so will have a direct impact on youth attitudes and youth use on these products. While the proposed rule also did not address the issue of flavored e-cigarettes, it's possible, indeed hopeful, that the final rule will do so, or at the very least indicate how FDA plans to address this issue in the future. In thinking about federal authority, it's useful to recognize that with the passage of the 2009 Act and FDA's assertion of its authority over e-cigarettes, FDA now has the legal authority over all nicotine-containing products. While I have focused on how FDA can <clears throat> use its authority narrowly to rein in the e-cigarette industry's behavior that threatens the progress that has been made, FDA does have the ability to begin to think more broadly, indeed more boldly, how to develop a comprehensive set of rules designed to support ongoing efforts to reduce tobacco use of all kinds among youth and at the same time, as John said, how to move as many people as possible who are current addicted cigarette smokers away from the tobacco products that cause harm to products that pose a minimum risk at most. In conclusion, it is still difficult to know the impact of current use of e-cigarettes among youth um, or on their eventual use of cigarettes. However, it's not too early to be concerned that current e-cigarette marketing practices and the use of flavorings that make these products so appealing to youth pose a threat to the progress that has been made. 
Despite the focus and the intense focus on e-cigarettes, it is vitally important that we continue to recognize and continue to focus on the fact that geographic places that have adopted best practices of tobacco control have shown that in the absence of e-cigarettes, we have the ability to create a tobacco-free generation. The critical question for all of us in achieving that goal is do we have the political will to achieve it? Thank you. So that brings us to the next uh, component of today, the question and answer session. Um, I'd encourage you, if you're in the room, to step up to the microphones flaking either side. And those online can also submit uh, questions. We have about 10 minutes. Um, we'll start with uh, the online question first. Can you elaborate a little bit on the research that has been done on the long-term effects of the syrup that is put in e-cigs? What harmful side effects will this pose in the future? When inhaled, what does it do to the lungs? Is it just as harmful as the tar produced when cigarettes are burned? And Dr. Samet, would you like to start? So this is the, one of the issues I spoke to, the concern about the flavorings. There we have concern from the experience with diacetyl, which has unfortunately a produced disease in workers and then been studied in the laboratory as uh, well. Of course, we don't have the long-term evidence that the questioner asks for, and I think that's why in highlighting research needs, I pointed to the need for watching for any cases of acute lung disease just like that uh, experienced by the workers. We now have uh, poss the possibility that children will begin to inhale these flavored uh, aerosols into their lungs at a young age while the lung is still uh, incomplete in its growth and perhaps sustain lasting effects. So I think the question points to an important issue for very careful monitoring. And we have a question um, in the room. Yes, Dr. Bunnell. Thank you so much uh, to all four speakers for great presentations. Um, I was wondering if any of you might be able to comment on the international landscape on e-cigarette uh, regulation or surveillance, uh, and maybe particularly touch on Public Health England's uh, position on this and how that affects our nation's efforts. I can try. Um, the international landscape is really um, dramatically varied. Uh, there are a number of nations that are treating e-cigarettes as drugs because of the content of nicotine and therefore are requiring them to go through the drug approval process. There's several nations that have banned the sale of e-cigarettes um, from the very get-go with regard to this. A number of nations are treating them as consumer products. The um, European Union's Tobacco Product Directive um, has developed a, a two-phase approach to them that will go into effect next year, uh, in part um, requiring treatment of e-cigarettes with uh, levels of nicotine below 20 milligrams um, um, as consumer products and anything over it as, as, a, uh, as a medicine. Um, the UK has taken a different approach from the very beginning. Um, it has a longer history of regulating products um, to try to reduce the harm of cigarettes under its medicines systems and has come up with a separate and independent set of rules and regulations. Um, to regulate their sale and their marketing. So that the type of marketing that, we're, that we have seen in the UK is really quite different than the type of marketing that we have seen in the United States. And the youth data that they have seen in the UK varies somewhat from the United States, which is partly an important lesson for all of us, which is that how different communities will respond to this will in fact depend on a number of variables independent of the product itself. How the government approaches it, or whether the government approaches it, the fact that the UK government was out in front earlier than ours has, may have had an impact. Second, rules governing in its marketing has clearly had an impact on how it's perceived both by adults and youth in the UK. Um, the ultimate answer is we still don't know about long-term impacts in the UK. Okay, another question from online. 
I am on an e-cigarette and have been using them for quite a while. What harm am I facing? Dr. Samet, would you like to take that one, please? Well, certainly one harm. I mean, without knowing further details uh, from the uh, question, I mean, certainly one uh, obvious harm is uh, continued addiction to nicotine if, in fact, this individual is um, addicted. Certainly there's enough nicotine uh, delivered or deliverable by these devices to maintain uh, nicotine addiction. If, uh, if our questioner happens to be an adolescent, we've highlighted some of the um, concerns about um, effects on the brain. There's the compared to what aspect of the question. So if this was an individual who was smoking regular combustible cigarettes, perhaps at 15 or 20 a day, then uh, I, I think we've heard that we anticipate, of course, lower risks for that individual with regard to the long-term health um, consequences. And then there are the unknowns. There's flavorings and the other issues that we have uh, spoken to. So it's an incomplete um, answer to a very uh, important question, one again, where a research agenda is clear. Additional question from online, if there's no others in the room. No. Is there any research on lipid inhalation for starters, rate of administration, or prolonged exposure to the non-nicotine contents? There's been some question about long-term exposure to the vehicle itself and whether it could cause a lipoid pneumonia, which I think is perhaps the, uh, what the question was uh, referring to. And I, I think, again, I would just say that that evidence is very fragmentary. There's some clinical reports not related to e-cigarettes per se of uh, exposure to the kinds of things that are in the vehicle and causation of sort of a chemical pneumonia, but uh, information directly related to electronic cigarettes, I think, is either unavailable or fragmentary. Um, we have another question in the room. Yes. Hi there. Thank you for your very enlightening presentations. What advice is given to tobacco prevention organizations and states in shifting focus from combustible cigarettes and tobacco to e-cigarettes? especially in those states that have the highest prevalence of tobacco use. What advice are you giving or can we give? Um, Thank you. Dr. Weissman, would you like to start from the state experience? Well, I think from the state experience, um, the issue is we can't lose focus of either. We actually have to do these together. Um, we can't lose focus on combustible uh, tobacco, and at the same time, we've got to make sure people understand the harms um, of electronic cigarettes for those who have not used before. So I think it's really a both. Um, and frankly, for a lot of us right now, the challenge simply is the funding. We know the best practices for tobacco. They're clear. We've been very successful in using them. We've driven down tobacco rates. Uh, but you can't do that without programs and without funding. And I would just add to that that I think the experience is, is uh, parallel at the national level. And the 2014 Surgeon General's report was, was very clear that the overwhelming burden of death and disease from tobacco use is combustible products, such as cigarettes and, and uh, other combustibles. And so we don't want to lose sight of the prize. And we know that in terms of public health burden, um, combustibles are, are public enemy number one. But it's important to remember e-cigarettes in that context and how that can influence patterns of combustible use moving forward. And so irrespective of where a state may, may be on the the continuum, um, we still need to remember that e-cigarettes are, are not um, the, the, the primary focus and combustibles are the, the public health burden, but we can't lose sight of these emerging products, including e-cigarettes and anything else that might come on the market and how that can impact our efforts to address combustible use using the proven interventions that we know work. And with that, I think we are out of time for our Q&A. Yes. Thank you very much for joining us and thank you to our speakers. And we'll see you next month for Public Health Grand Rounds.